μέσα σε θάλασσες βουνά Σε διαδρόμους σκοτεινούς Μες της ψυχής Welcome to the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. Before we begin, we ask that you please turn off and stow all phones and electronic or light emitting devices as these are distracting to others. All unauthorized video and photography is strictly prohibited. For your own safety, please take a moment to locate the nearest exit. Our usher staff is here to assist you in case of an emergency. This year's Notre Dame Forum, the global marketplace and the common good is a year-long discussion on the role of ethics, values, and morals in the rebuilding and reshaping of the global economy. Thank you for joining us. At this time, please welcome to the stage Notre Dame President Father John Jenkins. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we're just delighted to welcome to our campus to speak to us in this year's forum, the Global Marketplace and the Common Good, uh, Senator Evan Bayh. We would be happy to welcome him in any case, but we're particularly grateful because I think about uh, 48 hours ago, he was in New Zealand and uh, endured the earthquake there with his wife, uh, a harrowing experience. He, spent most of the last, uh, I don't know, 36 hours on a plane. He's terribly jet lagged, but he honored his commitment to come and speak to us, and, and I'm sure he will do a great job, and we're just so grateful to have, them, have him. Globalization, as we know, is, is such a force in our world and the world in which uh, you, our students, will live and have your careers. It has lifted millions out of poverty around the world, but it has also disrupted communities, taken jobs away from people, and it's an, a reality that we need to think deeply about. And so Senator Bai is so well qualified to help us think about these issues and to speak to us. Born in a political family, uh, Evan Bai would eventually win the seat held by his father, Senator Birch Bai, uh, a tremendous statesman from Indiana from, and Senator from 1963 to 1981. Senator Bai began his career by winning election as Secretary of State in 1986. He was first elected governor in 1988 and won re-election in 1992 which the, with the highest percentage of the vote in a statewide election in modern Indiana history. He was elected to the Senate in 1998 and served uh, to, to 2010. One year and a week ago, Senator Bai surprised the nation when he announced that he would not seek re-election in November. He cited a political environment that was hostile to com compromise and constructive problem solving. He said, quote, there's too much partisanship and not enough progress, too much narrow ideology and not enough practical problem solving. During his career, career Senator Bai showed a willingness to engage in dialogue and seek constructive compromise. That is the, precisely what we're trying to teach and to seek here at Notre Dame, to find the common good. He reined in during his career harsh political rhetoric and personal attacks that made compromise so difficult. He modeled the kind of civil discourse that we aspire to. We're fortunate to have him. He'll speak for about 20 minutes, take questions for about 30 minutes, and uh, then I'll conclude the program. So I'd like to warmly welcome, and ask you to warmly welcome to Notre Dame, Senator Evan Bayh. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. It's great to be here at Notre Dame uh, once again not only one of the uh, outstanding universities in our country, but one of the great centers of learning uh, anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, Father, I'm uh, very grateful for your kind introduction. You know, it's difficult to separate a, uh, uh, an institution like this uh, from uh, the people who comprise it. And during my uh, career, I've been blessed to work with three great leaders here. First, of course, was Father Ted. I'm glad to see us at the International Center's now a name for Father Ted. Well, that's delightful. What a, what a truly wonderful uh, man. 
Then for many, many years, Monk Molloy, I had a chance to collaborate with Monk, both as governor and the United States Senate, another outstanding leader, and now Father John, who follows in their footsteps and is leading this uh, great institution on to even greater heights. So Father, I want to thank you for your leadership here and for your, for your friendship. Also for that introduction, you know what, you were so kind, it's uh, always surprising when I'm introduced pretty much the way I wrote it, so I'm grateful to you for <laughs> sticking to the script, but I was getting a little nervous. It started sounding uh, so nice it was verging on a eulogy there for a moment. So uh, uh, in public life, it's no secret that um, uh, today, for a variety of reasons, the public is somewhat disenchanted with our political system and some of our political leaders. I've seen this manifested myself on some occasions. It was uh, last year before the election. I was here in Indiana campaigning on behalf of uh, a, a friend of mine, and Someone came up to me and asked, I said, uh, Senator, do you know the definition of the word politics? And I said, well, I think I do, but why don't you fill me in? And he said, well, it's really very simple. It's comprised of two parts. The first, poly, from the Greek word meaning many. And the second uh, part, ticks, from the Anglo-Saxon term for small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> and it kind of let me know what he thought about uh, politicians and public leaders. Uh, there was another occasion uh, years ago to show you this kind of runs in the, uh, it's part of skepticism about government, a healthy skepticism as opposed to a cynicism, which can be a little corrosive, is kind of in part of the American character. Uh, it was a decade or so ago when I was first seeking the Senate. I'd been governor for eight years, two years in the private sector, and I was running for the Senate. And a woman, I was shaking hands in a food line, a woman had a little twinkle in her eye, and she said to me, uh, she held onto my hand when I shook her hand, she said, uh, uh, Evan, do you realize you're about to, uh, you're, you're about to realize every young boy's dream? Uh, she caught my attention. I said, well, really, ma'am, what is that? And with that twinkle, she said, uh, you're about to run off to join the circus. So <laughs> there, there were days in Washington when I thought she was exactly right. And um, let me uh, do exactly what uh, Father John suggested, and that speak for maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and share with you some thoughts of my own. But I'd really rather have a dialogue, uh, if that's okay, because I'd rather uh, speak to what you're interested in rather than just what happens to be on my mind today. I obviously hadn't intended to speak about earthquakes or New Zealand, but let me just take a couple minutes uh, about that. Uh, the father uh, mentioned uh, the topic of globalization. I know Tom Friedman, who's a great thinker, someone I admire tremendously, has been here speaking about that. I feel like my last 48 hours have been an example of globalization. Uh, I was heading, I was the co-chairman of a delegation uh, from our country to New Zealand. We've been longtime friends, but had something of a rupture in our relationship back in the 1980s because of the anti-nuclear movement in New Zealand. They had uh, decided that they would not allow American ships that uh, were powered by nuclear power to dock in their country. Uh, we weren't so much concerned about that, but we were concerned about the precedent it would, it would set if Japan and other allies decided to take a similar uh, position. We basically would have very few places that our fleet could dock. Not many of the ships have nuclear weapons, but many of them have, are powered by nuclear power. And so that was going to be a big problem. So to set an example, uh, we basically severed our alliance with New Zealand uh, and uh, uh, led the effort to have them excluded from the military alliance in Southeast Asia. Uh, more recently, in the last five to ten years, we've been trying to heal that rift. And we've basically come to a point where we've agreed as friends to disagree about the nuclear issue, but collaborate on a whole host of other issues, including trade, uh, combating uh, uh, narcotics trafficking, combating global terrorism, a variety of other things. We really do have common interests and common values, but there's still this edginess to the relationship. So this was an effort to try and uh, uh, further that. We had the Assistant Secretary of State, the Assistant of Homeland Security, a delegation of about nine members of Congress were there, and I was uh, the American co-chair. Uh, we were, it was about at 12.50, our delegation had been divided up into, uh, all the, the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister was there, previous members of the uh, uh, Prime Ministers, members of the cabinet were there. So it was a high level group. Uh, this was the last day. My wife and I were supposed to be on a flight out of uh, Christchurch, which is just a lovely community for those of you who haven't been there. It was founded back in about 1850. And its architecture, a lot of the original buildings are of field stone and brick. It, it, if you can imagine what England might have looked like back at the turn of the 1900s, that's what the historic district of Christchurch looks like. There's a beautiful Anglican cathedral there with a large spire, at least there was. 
and so that there's this lovely historic district, beautiful rose gardens. Uh, it's it, just a, a beautiful city. People couldn't be nicer. Uh, we were supposed to be there. We were there for about two days, supposed to be leaving on a flight at 4.30. It was the final event. Uh, I was at Canterbury College for a luncheon and a speech. And my wife was downtown. She was supposed to be packing us up in our hotel, but she was out shopping, as it turned out, right in the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, so the quake hit, and uh, or I was at the college. There were no fatalities, but it was quite bad. It damaged the building that uh, I was in. It was a faculty gathering uh, building. It was an older structure, so it was quite damaged. Things were falling off the ceiling. We dove under the table. The windows were shattering, and it went on for what seemed like a long time. Uh, in reality, it was only about 45 seconds, but it was, if, when you think of the earth moving, it's a lot more violent than that, and then the structure was going back and forth. In any event, we emerged from under the table, and the, the, the New Zealanders are a lot like uh, Aussies. They have a, a zest for life. They love to travel, and uh, I'm sure they would admit that from time to time they love to have a, a glass of beer or a glass of wine. So we emerged from under the table. The glasses were all shattered. The wine bottles, they were serving, they were strewn all over the place. The, the, the Kiwi next to me dusts himself off, looks at the debris and the wreckage, and says, terrible shame about the wine. <laughs> so <clears throat> he was keeping his uh, humor about him. But uh, there was no electricity, and there were aftershocks about every 20 minutes. And we were standing out in the, on the lawn when the first aftershock hit. Of, it was very substantial. And this building built out of brick was just, go, it was it was this, it, they took a, a napkin out of my pocket was shaking it like this. This building was going back and forth. Parts of it were falling off. The ground was uh, moving quite uh, violently. And uh, so it was pretty clear that this was a serious state of affairs. So I set off for downtown. There was no cell phone uh, coverage. I went to find my wife. And about three hours of walking through uh, this city, the closer you got to the downtown area, the worse the destruction uh, became. Most people were fleeing this way. Occasionally, you'd come across someone who was bleeding or limping, um, uh, rescue workers trying to extract people from buildings. Uh, as you got downtown, buildings had collapsed. The fronts of buildings had been sheared off, and there were people inside uh, crying out to be rescued. Uh, there were injured people about, I think the, the current uh, uh, count is something like 75 to 80 fatalities, but there are about 200 people still unaccounted for. Most likely, uh, they will be uh, added to the the list of the fatalities. The uh, central cathedral had collapsed. There was a beautiful spire of several hundred feet, and there were tourists on the spire when it came crashing down, and there were people in the nave uh, there who also perished. My wife was about half a block away on a narrow shopping street in this historic district, and the, the man who owned the store grabbed her by the arm because they had just had a bad quake four months ago. This one was worse because I've learned more about earthquakes than I ever knew. This one was basically right under the city, so proximity matters. The previous one had been about 30 kilometers away. This one was right there. And apparently depth matters. The deeper, the less violent. The closer to the surface, the more violent. This one was uh, two-thirds closer to the surface than the previous one. So it was closer to the city and closer to the surface, which meant that it was uh, quite bad. So this man grabbed her, threw her out of the um, shop that he, uh, she was in, went back in to get some other people. She emerged from uh, this. There was dust uh, all about and that kind of thing. And uh, unfortunately, in front of her uh, was a woman who had had the misfortune to be under a falling piece of the building and uh, perished in the street uh, because of that. And um, ultimately, my wife was evacuated. I didn't know that. And then I had to make my way several hours out toward the airport where we finally uh, our delegational rendezvous, and um, later that night, about seven hours after the quake, uh, they put us on a C-130 that had flown supplies in and was now empty uh, back to Wellington. So uh, and from Wellington the next day, we went to um, Auckland, from Auckland to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to Washington, and now in, in South Bend, Indiana. So if that's not an example of globalization, I don't know uh, what is. But no, no, no. That's, uh, that, that, the, the, the reason I mention all of that is that I've not had much time to reflect on uh, what happened. When you're in the middle of something like that, you're literally just putting one foot in front of the other. And my idea was to find my wife and to make sure she was okay, and then to try and see what uh, could be done, if anything, to be helpful. And our, uh, our, our government, and it's, as I said, a part of the American character to be somewhat skeptical about our government. But when the chips are down, uh, whether it's following a 9-11 or an incident like this, 
Uh, there were you know, difficulties in the response to Hurricane Katrina, which hopefully will not be repeated. But my point is, uh, the people who work for us really are heroic in a situation like that. Uh, they were uh, unceasing, stayed up you know, throughout the night looking for Americans, trying to find the tourists who were there, making sure they were okay, trying to get them out of the country, so forth and so on. So at least, and then I'll get on to the body of my remarks, my initial reflections are, uh, number one, uh, there's just a certain amount of randomness in life that you can't plan for. I was in New York uh, a week ago and there was a quite successful Indian businessman there. He's a multi-billionaire. And he was asked, if, reflecting on his success, if he could mention what the most important factors were. The first thing he said was luck. Now, hard work, uh, thrift, ingenuity, all those sorts of things go into it too. Uh, but uh, there is a certain amount of randomness. So as we go about our lives, even in a great university like this, we need to prepare ourselves academically, physically, spiritually, to, to make the most of the opportunities that come our way. We can create those opportunities, but a certain number are left to chance. We have to prepare ourselves for whatever the future may hold. That's one of the great arguments in favor of a liberal arts education, not being overly specialized. And we have to prepare ourselves also for the adversity that may come our way. Uh, and that's uh, because it's an unav uh, unavoidable uh, part of life. The second thing, uh, that I would uh, mention is that physical things just aren't that important. We emerged from that country with just the clothes we'd been wearing. And for your sake, I'm terribly glad that I was able to change clothes last night in Washington. Uh, you wouldn't want to have been downwind of me after uh, several days of all that. But you know, we left everything there, but there are 200 and some families that would be consider themselves fortunate to have lost everything if they only had their loved one back. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, something that uh, a woman said at a conference I was at several years ago. And I understand Justice Sullivan may be in the audience today. Frank has heard me say this. His father was on the board of uh, this university for many years. So I'll be repeating this for him, but not for the rest of you. Uh, those of us in attendance at this function were asked to just in a minute or less reflect upon what, looking back on our lives, we concluded was uh, truly important. And we went around the room and people said a variety of things. And finally they came to this woman, her name was Stel Ramey. She was 80 something years old. And she said simply this, she said, looking back on my life, I realized that what was truly important, truly important, was who I loved and who loved me. The rest, that was just background music. There's a lot of truth in that. And so it's your friends, your family, those that you're uh, going to school with, the relationships that you forge, you'll never forget. That really is the stuff that makes life, uh, makes life worth living. Uh, which leads me to my final point. Uh, my mother was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer when she was only 38 years old. And now that I'm 55, uh, I realize just how young that was. And she had a mastectomy and she had uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatment and all that kind of thing and was in remission for about six years, which was a marvelous period of her life. She became the national spokeswoman for the American Cancer Society, going all across our country, uh, trying to uh, inform women about the importance of getting examinations, early detection, and all that kind of thing, because the survival rate is much, much higher if you detect uh, breast cancer early. She then unfortunately had a recurrence which took her life at age 46. The reason I mention all that is that whether it's an earthquake, or cancer or what, uh, whatever else. Life really, uh, even if you live into your 80s or 90s, is just in the, it's the blink of an eye. I look at my own sons now, who I used to be able to hold both in my arms. We have twin boys. They're now 15 and, and I would throw my back out if I tried to pick up either one. And I, you know, I just, it's, uh, uh, it's a metaphor for life. It goes by before you know it. So you gotta embrace each and every day. Get up every morning to make the most of that day. Make the most of what you do in class. Make the most of your friendships and your family relationships because you just can't take life for granted. Uh, so those are my three observations uh, coming out of Christchurch. And um, we can talk about that or not if you'd like um, when, when we're done. With regard to the topic that uh, we're all here uh, for, let me just make a few brief observations. Uh, it's not only globalization, but it's the role of of uh, our government, public figures, 
in promoting the common good in, increase, in an increasingly interrelated and complex world. I thought this was an interesting topic because for those of you who have studied our Constitution, you'll know that our country is really founded uh, at its essence on the notion of individual liberty and freedom. The first 10 uh, amendments to our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, are all guarantors of individual rights against the government. We rebelled against a king, and we did not want an overbearing, uh, heavy-handed government intruding upon our individual liberties. And most of the rest of the Constitution is a restraint upon the use of state power as well. Uh, in this regard, we are the latest guarantors of a long strain of human nature that is now playing itself out across the Middle East, uh, in Cairo, in Tunisia, now in Libya. But its roots go much, much deeper than that, all the way back to the hillsides in ancient Athens during the Greek democracy, uh, to the fields in Runnymede in England when the nobles decided uh, to assert their rights against uh, the crown, uh, to the village greens in Lexington and Concord here in our own country when our forebears decided to establish a republic as opposed to remaining uh, under the King of England. All the way down to those of us here today, it is that innate human desire to make the most of ourselves, to enjoy freedom in all of its manifestations, the, the freedom to enjoy the fruits of our own labors, the freedom to worship God as we see fit, the freedom to speak our minds, to associate with those of our own choosing, the freedom to elect our government officials who will govern over us. That is something that is innate and essential uh, and inseparable from the American experience. Now with the passage of time, we've come to learn uh, that in a modern world, increasingly interconnected uh, to the rest uh, of the planet, if we are gonna maximize that freedom as individuals, that there are some things that perhaps we need to do together. I think, uh, you know, back, this has been a long evolutionary process, back in colonial times, there were no public fire departments. They just didn't exist. Each of the colonists in the, the colony of Massachusetts was required to purchase fire insurance on their own. And if they wanted to take out that insurance, they could, and if they didn't want to pay for it, they didn't have to. Well, it didn't take the colonists too long to figure out that fire didn't respect uh, boundaries between homes based on who had insurance or who didn't. And if my house caught on fire and I didn't have insurance and so no one would come to put it out, that didn't keep the fire to, to, from spreading to your house, even though you did have insurance. And so they established public fire departments to put out fires because if the entire community burned down, it hurt everybody. And so my freedom to go without insurance uh, indirectly jeopardized you. Uh, fast forward to today, a little bit uh, more modern example. We learned when automobiles became widespread that uh, those who were driving automobiles who caused injury or fatalities uh, who were uninsured and who did not have resources did not have the ability to compensate those they'd injured uh, if they were uninsured. And so, of course, now when you drive an automobile in our state and all the others, there is a requirement that we each have insurance so that our freedom to drive an automobile does not impose on some unsuspecting third party uh, uh, costs so that the exercise of our freedom does not unwittingly trample upon uh, someone else's uh, freedom without their consent. And there are just so many examples uh, going on. I think, and I'm delighted to, uh, Tom Friedman uh, was here. He's someone I respect a great deal, very insightful about the modern economy and uh, the Middle East and so many other things, energy policy and all that. If I had to guess about where the American economy is going, what is our, as the economists would say, what is our place in, in the economy of the future? What is our comparative advantage? I'd say it was in the more highly innovative parts of the global economy. And this represents a real change. If we'd been gathered here in St. Joe County 100 years ago, more than half of all the people in this community and in our state and in this country, more than half would have been involved in agriculture. Today, it's about 3%. And yet we produce more than enough food to feed ourselves. We are the world's leading exporter of foodstuff. So with from 50% to 3%, we not only feed ourselves, but we help feed the rest of the world as well because agriculture has become much more capital intensive over the last century. Uh, but we went on from being an agrarian society to the next big thing, which was the Industrial Revolution, 
and manufacturing, which in the state of Indiana, my home state, still has a higher percentage of manufacturing employment than any other state in the United States of America. Uh, but it's not what it used to be. Manufacturing employment peaked in our country in about 1949, 1950, at about 30, 35 percent of the workforce. Today it's about mm, six, well, it's about, I think about 12 percent. In our state it's probably 16, 17 percent. But again, we manufactured goods for export across the globe, really without peer. Uh, today we still uh, have a, it's shrunk in terms of employment, but in terms of its contribution to our gross domestic product, it continues to grow. Uh, but it's not what it used to be in terms of uh, the percentage of our economy. It's about half of what it was at its peak. And yet we went on to the next big thing, uh, the information economy, the service economy. And I think it is soon to be the innovation economy. So if we care about being globally competitive, about having a better standard of living for ourselves and for those who will follow, creating good job opportunities, which allow you to have, be, have an upwardly mobile society, we have to think very carefully about what leads to innovation. And when you start thinking about that, you pretty quickly come to, to there are many things, a lot of things, but two things are, are preeminent. Number one, investment in research and development, creating new goods, new cures, new processes, new ways of communicating, uh, constantly reinventing those things, and the pace of change has accelerated as never before. And uh, we still lead the world in the, percent, in the amount of uh, money we invest in R&D, but the Chinese have caught up with us. And our curve is about flat. Their curve is uh, steeply ascendant. A big part of our curve is military R&D, which is not without its uses because uh, the space program, for example, we probably wouldn't have, uh, probably wouldn't have uh, things like this if it weren't for NASA and the Defense Department because in order to create missiles capable of putting humans into space. They had to uh, become expert at miniaturization and the use of lightweight alloys to construct things. Um, but it's not quite as, it doesn't have quite the impact on the private economy that private R&D does. So we really need to up our investment as a society in research and development, including at great research universities like this one. And we also need to make sure that our citizens can take advantage of the fruits of innovation uh, by being innovators themselves. And that involves a high degree of education and increasingly emphasis on uh, advanced degrees. Uh, a failure to do that will not only impact the growth of our economy as a whole, but the way in which the resources that we create are distributed. And you can see that already. We have, we're having a great debate, and appropriately so, in our country about a growing gap between the haves and have-nots. And I used to sit in the Democratic caucus, and we discussed this. And I often think to myself, if you put a chart uh, on an easel with the distribution between the top uh, quintile and the, the other quintiles, and you put laid over that uh, another chart showing the distribution of uh, uh, educational degrees, no high school, high school diploma, part college, college degree, advanced diploma, it would track almost, very, there's a very close correlation to the distribution of resources. People who are high school dropouts in our country today you know, 40, 50 years ago, you could go into a plant, go into a factory, have a middle class standard of living. That's pretty tough to do today. Uh, and they have seen, people who have dropped out of high school have seen their real uh, standards of living decline substantially. People with a high school degree have seen their standards of living decline, but not nearly as substantially. People with a college degree have actually seen an in, uh, increase uh, in their standard of living. People with advanced degrees have done quite well. And so we need to prepare our citizens to live in that kind of world. And still, the bottom third of our students, particularly in the schools that are more challenged, are just not getting the basic building blocks of education they need to be economically relevant in a world characterized by increasingly rapid rates of innovation. And that is going to have a profound consequence on our society, both economically, socially, and, and politically, if we don't address that. And so there's an example of how collective action and you look at R&D, uh, a lot of that is private, but that tends to be focused on a certain kind of research. Broad basic research, doesn't, which serves as a foundation upon which much of applied research takes place, just does not get a return in the private marketplace that will lead many uh, private companies to invest in basic physics, basic chemistry, basic biology, those sorts of things. 
Uh, so there is a, a legitimate role for us to come together collectively if we assume that that kind of research is in our best interest because the marketplace is not providing it. Uh, there is a, uh, a legitimate argument to be made for collective action in that kind of research to pursue the economic growth that will enable us to kind of have the society we want. There's also, I think, a compelling argument to be made for focusing on the quality of education and doing what we can to ensure that all of our citizens get the kind of education they need to be economically relevant. It reminds me of the, the beginning of the common school movement back in the late 1800s. Why was there public education to begin with in America? It's because as people moved off the farms into cities, they quickly uh, came to realize that when they were on the farm, they could uh, learn most of the skills they needed, handed down grandfather to father, father to son, grandmother to uh, mother, mother to daughter, and so forth. They didn't really need to expand their uh, realm of knowledge, but when they went into the city, became involved in an industrial economy, that was no longer the case. And I think today you can make a compelling argument, both economically and just uh, politically, if we want to have a vibrant democracy, all of us just need to know a lot more about what's going on to make intelligent decisions about those who would lead us. Uh, I'm going to go shoot way beyond my time limit here, but let me just tick off three other major challenges for you uh, that I think are relevant to our discussion, and then I'll wrap it up and we'll get to the the questions and answers. So uh, the, the globalization of the economy, uh, America's place in that as an innovative society has profound uh, consequences and raises important questions for the role of the state in its interface with those of us as individuals. How do we maximize, cherish our individual freedoms and liberties, retaining the ingenuity, uh, the self, uh, the personal responsibility, the competitiveness that has always characterized the American spirit on the one hand, while still authorizing collective action to maximize the fruits of that liberty on the other. Uh, when you're dealing with a global economy, there really is a robust discussion uh, there uh, to be had. Let me go to a completely different world for you. I, I served on the Intelligence Committee for uh, 10 years, and we always, hoped that the term, uh, we always hoped that the term Senate Intelligence Committee was not an oxymoron, uh, and I, I hope it was not. Um, uh, by the way, in the intelligence world, it's kind of a, a foreboding world because these folks are dealing with national security threats 24-7. The definition of an optimist in the intelligence world, an optimist is someone who doesn't yet have all the facts. So uh, it's kind of a dark world, but that's what they deal with, and we're all fortunate they're there. Take 9-11, for example. You had 20 or so individuals, religious fanatics, suicidal, uh, bound and determined to kill as many Americans as they possibly could. Uh, they, and they wanted to maximize the economic damage as well. They killed 3,000 individuals. If they could have killed 10,000 of us, they would have. 100,000 of us, they would. If they could get their hands on a nuclear device, they'd use it without, without thinking. A biological agent wouldn't stop them. A chemical agent, use that too. Uh, there really are no limits uh, because uh, they are suicidal. Now, this changes the whole notion of our self-defense. Following the Second World War, uh, we relied on the doctrine of deterrence. We had some pretty profound disagreements with the Soviet Union and the other communist countries. They've got a lot of nuclear weapons. Uh, they were never used because we knew that despite our profound differences, at the end of the day, they were probably rational decision makers and they were not suicidal. Even someone like Kim Jong-il in North Korea, he's a pretty erratic uh, person. But a lot of his behavior can be explained by the fact that he wants to live. He wants to remain in power. He wants to hand that regime down to his third oldest son now. He doesn't want to die. When you're dealing with someone who's perfectly happy to die, as long as they're killing as many of us as they can, deterrence doesn't work quite so well. And so you've got to come up with a different approach to dealing with those kind of threats to protect our personal liberty and to maximize the common good. And this leads to a whole debate about uh, personal liberties, about uh, what kind of uh, eavesdropping is uh, appropriate? What kind of uh, surveillance is appropriate? Uh, what is appropriate abroad versus appropriate here on our own shores? What, what is the interconnection between the intelligence world and the law enforcement world, where one set of standards apply if you're a United States citizen under the laws and the Constitution, and another set, set of standards apply if you're a foreign national and not our, uh, uh, an American citizen? If you get it wrong on the one hand, you've trampled on our civil liberties, which goes right to the core of who we are. If you get it wrong on the other hand, people die, which may be the uh, greatest uh, uh, destruction of civil liberties when someone is actually killed. 
So how do you strike that balance? And we've got some really patriotic individuals who on a day-to-day -day basis are trying to strike that balance in the right kind of way. I don't envy them their, their jobs, but these threats are global in nature. I mean, for example, this package that was um, intended to blow up on the UPS plane, uh, it was uh, uh, intended for a synagogue, but the device was structured in a way that was going to blow up somewhere over the East Coast, so we're never going to get to the synagogue. But it, uh, it uh, originated in Yemen, was put on a, a UPS plane that uh, stopped in Europe and then was coming over here. Uh, I can't mention the name, but we, it, the, the device was so sophisticated, it went through all the detection equipment. The only reason we were able to stop that threat and prevent the people on that plane from dying and other people possibly from getting hit by the debris and bringing the entire uh, postal system to a, a screeching stop. The only reason we were able to stop that is that we received a tip from an allied intelligence service who had an agent who knew somebody who tipped us off saying you probably ought to look at the packages emanating from there. Uh, that kind of intelligence was the only way we were able to prevent that calamity. And that's just one example. Uh, instances like that go on all the time, every day. So there's another example. The, the, the threat to our liberties in our country is global in nature. We have to deal with that, but we have to do it in a way that uh, preserves our individual liberties and maximizes the common good at home. So we have to be secure, but at the same time true to our values. That's a tough balance to strike, uh, but it's one that we have to strike in the world in which we know it. A couple of other things I'll just mention briefly. We have an unsustainable financial situation now. We are borrowing trillions and trillions of dollars. It's about to come to a head here in the next couple of months over a vote in the Congress about whether to raise the debt ceiling or not. This is an example of where those of us today have been exercising through our elected officials our freedom uh, to borrow money. But it's a decision you can only make once. Uh, our children and grandchildren are gonna have to pay the bills. They didn't participate in making these decisions. So did our uh, freedom to borrow money. How does that relate to the freedom of those who come along behind us who are gonna have to pay higher taxes or have lower government spending to pay for this sort of thing? Uh, that's a pretty important debate we're having. And it's, if we do nothing and we continue the, our, our public debt as a percentage of our economy has gone from about 40% to it's now 65%, it's heading toward about 100%. And that's getting us perilously close to these other countries that have seen uh, real crises, and it has an impact on their economies. You can see what's going on in Greece, Ireland, uh, possibly Portugal next. It's going to mean slower rates of growth, real pressure on the social uh, safety net in those countries, and it's something that we have to come to grips with as a matter of economics, but also as intergenerational responsibility. How do we do that in a way uh, that maximizes the public good uh, and yet uh, is not so draconian uh, that it leads to uh, outcomes that uh, none of us would want. I'd be happy to get into great length with, uh, with you on that. That's going to be over. That, I think that will dominate the public discourse in our country starting in March. It's already starting now. And you see some of it in the state capitals here in our own state of Little Wisconsin's another example, Ohio, several others. Uh, it's really going to dominate the debate in Washington from March until it's resolved. If it's not resolved, we only postpone the day of reckoning until the credit markets. Uh, react and interest rates go way up or our currency collapses and that would be a very disadvantageous to our economy. A lot of other things I could say. Uh, the aging of our population is one that has impact in, uh, it's going to have a profound impact on our uh, retirement system and our health care system in particular. We can talk about that if you're interested but let me just conclude that even in the face of all these challenges, and I've just ticked off some of them, uh, the globalization of the economy, the global uh, nature of the, the security challenges we face, uh, the fiscal challenges that we face, the aging of our population is another, uh, some of the dysfunction in our political process that leads to so much gridlock uh, rather than problem solving, which ironically really is what most Americans want. The two wings of the party, the two extremes are perfectly happy to fight it out. The people in the middle really don't care. They just want to see us solve these problems and we're not doing a very good job as far as they're concerned. But in spite of all of that, so we do need some political reforms, but in spite of all of that, I am really optimistic about our future. Uh, one of the reasons I'm optimistic uh, is if you look at the competition. Uh, Europe is aging. Uh, they're not structured for very, very rapid rates of economic growth, and they're head over heels into debt. They are unlikely to be 
uh, eclipsing America as we go forward. Uh, they're going to, you know, they'll hang in there okay, but they're not going to overshadow America as we go forward. There will probably be another uh, power center centered around the uh, Indian, subcon Indian subcontinent. Uh, they've got well more than 1.2, 1.4 billion people. Uh, they're very uh, innovative. They are a democracy, which uh, uh, in the long run I believe is an advantage, but they have a huge population of uh, very poor individuals, eight, nine hundred million people. And how they go about dealing with that and empowering those individuals while maintaining some uh, political stability is going to be a great challenge for the Indian economy and the Indian system of governance. So I think India will be a great society, but they have their challenges cut out for them too. They will increase in their significance, but I don't think they'll eclipse America. The fourth great block, besides the North American block, uh, will be uh, China. And China is really on a roll. Their economy is growing by 9, 10% a year. They're piling up huge financial uh, surpluses, current account surpluses, uh, and uh, they are very innovative. Uh, their great weakness is, and they're, they are a resilient people, they work hard, their savings rates are high, uh, and so China is really on the move. They're investing large sums in their military and so forth. Uh, but China's great weakness is they have more than a billion people. They have hundreds of millions coming off the land where they no longer are needed in agriculture, and they ha have no political system to absorb these people. And as you're seeing across the Middle East, millions and millions of displaced uh, people, particularly young people, with less than good prospects in the economy uh, le leads to social unrest. So in the long run, the Chinese are going to have to look at their political system, which now their sole legitimacy with their people derives on their ability to deliver these high rates of economic growth. They're not elected. There's no social contract there. It's just simply a, a, a relationship of uh, convenience. If the economy ever slows down, something happens to disrupt that, you could see some real social disturbances in China. The Chinese are worried about that. So how do they evolve their political system over time to allow their people to participate more as their wealth increases in that is the great challenge for the Chinese. Uh, and I think that they will be uh, ascendant and probably our major competitor going forward, both economically and from a national security perspective. But if I had to bet, I'd put my money on America uh, because part of its history, you look at the challenges we've overcome, whether it's civil wars or world wars, great depressions, now coming out of a great recession, you look at the innate dynamism, the ingenuity, and when the chips are down, the innate goodness of the American people, and I just think that we're going we're gonna to succeed. And I'll just end up with a story uh, that kind of summarizes it for me. After I got my law degree, I went to work for a federal judge in the Southern District of Indiana. And twice a year, we would swear in the new citizens. And for those of you who have not seen this, you really ought to take a moment and go see one of these things. We take, our, we, we take belonging to this country so much for granted. And these new citizens don't. Uh, I served as the clerk, so I'd come in, I'd ask everybody to rise, and there they, there'd usually be, you know, 150 of them. They were all dressed up. You could tell that this was a big deal. They'd put on their, their finest garments. Each of them was holding a little American flag. They'd invited their friends and their family there to witness them becoming American citizens because this was, this was a big deal. And it came from all over, you know, every, every nationality. So the judge would come in, and uh, he'd ask them to be seated. And here's, he'd give a little, little two-minute statement. And here's what the judge would say. He'd say, the oath that you're about to take is unlike the oaths that are given in most other countries. The oath of loyalty to the United States of America is not based upon ethnicity. It's not based upon race. It's not based upon religion. It's not based upon membership in a political party. It's really not even based upon a geographic area because that has changed over time. When you take an oath of loyalty to the United States and to support the Constitution, it really is a an oath of loyalty to an idea, an idea that for more than 200 years has delivered more hope and opportunity from people, to people from every walk of life and every country across the planet the ability to work hard and study hard and to save and to invest for a better future so that your children and your grandchildren 
can have a better standard of living and more freedom than you have had. That's what America is all about, freedom and opportunity. And as long as we hold tight to those ideals and understand what together we can do to promote them in an increasingly complex and interconnected world, I place my bet on the future of the United States. Thank you for having me. Now, having said all that, I'd be happy to take some questions. And uh, I guess we've got microphones on the right and on the left. So come on down, or I'll have to get back behind the lectern and start speaking again. <laughs> By the way, as they're filing down here, uh, my son, I've got twin 15-year-olds, and one of my boys was going to be coming with me tonight, but he's got a really hard-nosed lacrosse coach. And my son is a freshman, and he's going to be tr he's trying out for the varsity, and the, the lacrosse coach insisted that he beat today and tomorrow were his tryouts. But my son is really interested in Notre Dame. So what my son is doing tonight, he attended his entire tryout today. My wife is driving him to the airport. He's changing in the car. Uh, she's putting him on a flight to O'Hare. I've got a good friend who's going to be picking him up at the airport and driving him over tonight so he can stay with me at the Morris Inn so he can see Notre Dame tomorrow. So, uh, and he had a coach once who uh, had, was a player at Notre Dame uh, but was coaching at a clinic somewhere my son was at and he gave my son his uh, helmet after the clinic was over. So he's obviously got his team uniforms and stuff like that. But there for a while when they'd be out scrimmaging, I could look at, I could always spot my boy. He was the one with the bright gold helmet. <laughs> Everybody else had blue or green or white, but my son had gold. So uh, yes, for, t tell me where you're from. Hi, uh, from a military family. Military family, good for you. Lived all over the place. What, what branch of the service were your folks in? Uh, Air Force. Good. Okay, so this is a question I was on a C-130 uh, about 36 hours ago. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I've been on those. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, Great planes, but not built for comfort, let me tell you. Yeah. So this is a question about what it's like to be a politician. Okay. Um, as a leader and as someone who competes for votes, it's important that you appear confident about what you believe. But like, how confident are you really? Like, <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you ever make a political decision that you aren't really comfortable about? Do you ever hear your opponent debating you and think, actually, maybe he's right, you know? <laughs> Well, that's, those are some great questions. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, there aren't too many people who go into public life who are uh, suffering from a loss of self-esteem. Is that kind of a polite way to put it? Or tortured by self-doubt. I think, uh, you know, some level of ego, hopefully balanced off by other attributes, is just kind of part of the, the job description. So um, most people are fairly, you know, confident. If you're not, uh, it's hard to... You have to be a little extroverted and a little confident just to kind of, I don't know how you'd succeed if you didn't have some of that in your, in your DNA. Uh, so that'd be my first observation. My second observation would be, you know, if you're, if you're intellectually curious and you care about issues, uh, of course you're gonna be internally conflicted uh, most of the time, or not, at least some of the time. Now, if you're just an ideologue and you just got a worldview, you know, just one worldview answers everything. Well, that's kind of easy. You know, you just get up in the morning, you got the same answer for everything. Uh, and ideology is useful. It's kind of a good starting point. It, gets, it keeps you grounded. But from my experience, I've not found life to be quite that neat and orderly. Uh, sometimes, uh, what I care about are practical answers to real life problems. And sometimes you can find some truth in different ideologies in, how, in terms of how they're actually going to work in the real world. Not in a, not in a political science classroom and not on the... Uh, op-ed page of a newspaper, but actually in real life. How is this thing going to work? In the Senate, you can see that you can see there is a palpable difference between people who have been an executive, who've run a state, run a city, run a business, who've actually had to implement decisions rather than just vote for them in the abstract, and they tend to be less ideological. So, of course, I, mean, I find a lot of decisions, a lot of decisions I've had to, made, had to make have been, you know, 60-40 decisions. Sometimes they're 51-49 decisions. And sometimes you realize, you know, I think on balance this is the right thing to do, 
but I do acknowledge that there are some, some other things on the other side of this. Very rarely are decisions 100 to nothing. Um, what did somebody once say? If you get two smart people together and they agree on everything, one of them's not thinking very much. So it's just, life's not quite that way. So sure, you're conflicted, or at least, you know, I've been on some pretty important decisions. I do what I think's right because I think that's where the balance lies. Uh, but uh, there are usually pluses and minuses to any kind of significant decision you're going to make. And so it's not uncommon that I'll be listening to someone else. Uh, it's uncommon that I'll, I'll actually say, you know what, I think I did the wrong thing. But it is not uncommon, and of course you should consciously never do uh, what you think is the wrong thing, uh, but it is not uncommon that you can listen to someone where you ultimately reach a different conclusion while still acknowledging that they've got some good points and an honorable, reasonable, an honor, and this is important, that an honorable, reasonable person could actually reach a different conclusion than you have reached. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Miss. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. By the way, for those of you over here, there's a microphone over there. At the... Yeah, I was ready to cede there, but go ahead. First, thank you for the presentation. And uh, second, thank tell, you. Tell me, where are you from? I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Oh, so you're no stranger to snow, huh? Uh, no, it doesn't mean I like it, though. Okay. <laughs> you, um, like, you like wings? I do like wings. Okay, I'll, ahead. Ahead. I'll, admit that. Right. Hey, you know. I'll admit that. Me too. Um, <laughs> good. You, you can come visit us then, and uh, we'll take you out for good wings at Duff's. Thank you. Um, for, so first, thanks for the presentation. And second of all, thanks for your enthusiasm for c collaboration and real problem solving. And what I wanted to ask is, now you've stepped back from the Senate um, because of your frustration that there wasn't enough collaboration and, and um, interpartisan work. And what I'd, what I'd like to ask is, what do you see as some of the arenas or contexts or forums that are most promising for collaborative efforts um, that will produce real changes and, and effective changes? And in particular, um, changes that are broader than those already invested in the change, so to speak. Boy, that's a great question. And um, first, let me say this. Uh, I had been in elected office for 20 out of 22 years. So it's something that I cherish uh, and embrace. Uh, and I'm m delighted I did that with the bulk of my uh, life. Uh, this was just the right time to make a change for me for a variety of reasons. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'll be out of you know, public life for the rest of my life. I can see hopefully making a contribution in any number of ways. So I don't want any of you to think that I've concluded that uh, elected office is not honorable or productive or that kind of thing. It was just for a variety of reasons the right time for me to, to make a change. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, what's going on in politics today? Uh, the, the two bases of the parties, uh, I've never seen them more alienated. And you know, I grew up in the 1960s and early 70s, and for a period there, I mean, thank God today we don't have political assass We actually had political assassinations in this country. Uh, you know, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, George Wallace was shot. I mean, you know, it was a pretty violent period. Uh, we had riots uh, in most major cities. Uh, I remember when I was a boy, the National Guard had been called out, the military had been mobilized, there were, there were machine guns on top of important government buildings in our nation's capital. And this is not Cairo, this is not Tunisia, you know, it's not Tehran, this is Washington, D.C. So, you know, we've gone through turbulent periods before. Having said that, boy, the far right and the far left, uh, they're almost on the verge of thinking that the, the uh, other side is just not, they're not real Americans, they're not patriotic, they're somehow disloyal. And this is manifesting itself in politics. Uh, you can see it um, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle last time. Bob Bennett, who'd been an 18-year senator in Utah, wasn't nominated by his own party. Uh, Lisa Murkowski in Alaska wasn't nominated by her own party. She ended up winning as a write-in candidate. That's a pretty unusual thing. Mike Castle, a guy I serve with as governor, um, Republican in Delaware, uh, wasn't nominated by his He was ahead by 20 points. The, the Republican Party basically gave the Democratic Party that seat because Castle was ahead by 20 points. He loses the primary because he's not viewed as being conservative enough. Christine O'Donnell is nominated. She's 20 points behind, loses. So Chris Coons, who's a great guy, won. I'm glad he won. But my point is, the, the, on, on the, the Democratic side, an example would be uh, Blanche Lincoln, moderate from Arkansas, uh, where about 12 or $13 million was spent against her 
by the more progressive elements of my party because they didn't view her as being su uh, sufficiently orthodox. So th the tolerance for any deviation from party orthodoxy is just practically uh, non-existent. And that makes it pretty hard to work together. Uh, in the House of Representatives, it's the gerrymander that's destroyed things. Uh, last year was an exception because it was a wave election, but most of the time out of 435 seats in the House, no more than 40 or 50 of them are really competitive. So if you come from a district that's more Democratic, you move to the left because you don't have a primary challenge. If you come from one that's more Republican, you move to the right because you don't want a primary, so primary challenge. You've got all these people who've moved to the left or moved to the right, and if you're gonna make progress, it's gotta be in the middle, and the middle's kind of fallen away. In the Senate, uh, the vast sums of money uh, that have to be raised have uh, served the same function to kind of polarize the Senate, and you see um, uh, moderates of, on both sides either uh, dropping out or being defeated. And so it's made cooperation very uh, difficult. For a Republican today to, to actually stand up and say, I'm going to work with President Obama and the Democrats on fill in the blank, could be anything, you'd almost guarantee yourself of having a, a difficult primary. And on the Democratic side, uh, increasingly, if you don't kind of vote down the line on things, same sort of thing. So uh, that has led to, and there's some things we need to do to correct that. Uh, California, the Supreme Court has ruled that states are allowed to gerrymander. Uh, I don't know what the constitutional basis uh, of that is, but apparently it's there. But some states are saying that they don't want to do that. California has established a, uh, a system now where it's going to be a nonpartisan system for drawing congressional districts. Uh, that will be more responsive to moderates and independents. The more of that kind of thing we can have, the better off we'll be. We've got to come up with a, a way to deal with the vast sums of money sloshing through the political process. And it's going to be even more corrosive. It was more corrosive this last time. It's going to be more corrosive this next time. There are tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in secret contributions. You don't even know who they are, who are, are now you know, getting involved to influence the outcome of elections. Uh, there's got to be some way to deal with that, but it's hard because the people who have thrived under a certain system are reluctant to change that system. Uh, but that said, here's what's happening. 2006 was a change election, primarily because of Iraq, but some other things as well. So the Republicans were in public votes against the, uh, the Republicans. 2008, another change election. The economy's not good. Uh, there were a number of other things going on there. So another vote against the Republicans. Last year, another change election. This time the Democrats are in. Public takes it out on us because the economy's not good number of other things going on. My point is, uh, if you look at what's happened in each of these years, it's the independents who go back and forth. They're finally saying, enough already. And, and I'll get to your question. What really needs to happen for there to be more collaboration and cooperation in the public arena is for all of us, and these people work for us, to stand up and say, we're not going to vote for you anymore. If you're just a strident ideologue, that's not what we want. Uh, if you're not willing to try and have a principled compromise, that's not what we want. If you just run a negative campaign where all you tell us is why your opponent's no good, we're not going to vote for you. So that's what ultimately needs to happen. We need to take the government back for those of us who think it ought to be working in a little bit uh, a different way. So that's the public side. In the private sector, companies, universities, philanthropies, what goes on in Washington politics, it's just a different world. There's a lot more collaboration. There's a lot more sitting down and thinking about, okay, how do we grow this business to create value, to create jobs? How do we need to be, what do we need to do to export, to be globally competitive? How do we make uh, the quality of education continue to be at the cutting edge for an outstanding research institution like this one? How do we go about providing uh, you know, better assistance uh, to cure cancer if you're the American Cancer Society? It's a lot more practical. People. People don't think like partisans or ideologues. It's a lot more, okay, what do we need to do together? And that's why I'm optimistic in the long run, because this strident partisanship and ideology, while it currently has a grip of the people who participate in the political process, it really does not define the American character historically, as I understand it, and currently today as I know it. So I'm, that's why I'm optimistic we're just going through this dysfunctional period here, but a combination of the public insisting on change and outside forces, exogenous factors, imposing change on us whether we like it or not, I'm confident will lead to more of the cooperation that we need. To get it in the public space, though, you really do need uh, some political reforms, which we can talk about to further, but uh, money is a big part of it, unfortunately. Did that at least talk around your question a little bit? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. 
Where are you from? From LA, California. Oh, no kidding. First of all, thank you for my, being- My wife went to La Cunada High School. Oh, I'm actually from La Cunada. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, very good. Not even, not even kidding. Yeah. yeah <laughs> First she, of all, thank you for being here. She went here. to Cal undergrad and to SC to, uh, <laughs> to law school. And, uh, but she's, as she always tells me, she's a Hoosier by choice. But. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. I enjoyed your speech, especially the part where you talked about our loved ones and how everything else is background noise, which leads me to a question about American foreign policy. Yeah. You talked about dealing with people who aren't afraid of death and how it compromises traditional defense tactics in the United States. In our wars in the Middle East, thousands of innocent civilians were caught in the crossfire. Chances are they are loved ones, friends, and families of the people who want to kill us. How do we make sure we win these wars without giving more people a reason to not fear death by taking away everything they have to live for? What was the last part of your statement? Um, by taking we, away? By taking away everything they have to live for. By killing their loved ones. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that's an excellent question, and um, it's a very difficult one. Um, first, let me tell you, uh, I know, uh, for, wait, let's, Afghanistan and Iraq are somewhat different things. Um, we were attacked from Iraq. Uh, the regime there, the Taliban, uh, was um, a fairly tyrannical uh, theocracy. For example, for those women in the audience today, you would have no rights whatsoever. Couldn't go, to, uh, couldn't go out without having your face covered. Couldn't get an education. Girls who tried to go to school were beaten. Uh, you, almost the property of your uh, father or your husband. Uh, so all that was going on. And the, uh, the Taliban was basically, uh, had provided a safe haven for Al Qaeda. They still do. I mean, you'd think after we ran them out of their country, they'd conclude that associating with Al Qaeda was probably not in their best interest. But they're still like this uh, in Pakistan. So we've not been able to really drive a wedge between the Taliban and Al Qaeda. So, the Afghan war was really more of an act of self-defense to try and prevent a, another attack like that. Now, you can, we can have a long debate about whether what's going to happen to Afghanistan, what kind of place it will be, whether ultimately we'll be successful in uh, securing that as, a, as we withdraw, whether it will hang together in a way that will keep the Taliban from coming back and bringing Al Qaeda with them. That's a long discussion. But what I wanted to assure you, and I've, I've seen these things, um, and I know them to be true because I've actually seen them. We, we bend over backwards. Uh, I mean, we go to enormous lengths to, we even, we even allow uh, bad people, murderers, uh, terrorists, uh, really bad people who've killed women, children without remorse. Uh, we don't go after them if we think there is going to be what we call collateral damage. And I've witnessed this with my own. We will sometimes follow uh, with these drones We'll follow someone for days, literally days. And if they're in a crowded area, we won't take a shot. If they're around their wife or child, we won't take a shot. There are rare exceptions. If we found uh, Osama bin Laden or Ayman Zawahiri, we'd probably do it. Uh, but, uh, and if we lose them, we actually, that happens. And we, we, that happens because we haven't taken a shot. That's just something that happens. So we try to hold ourselves to a standard where we minimize what you're talking about. Some of these reports in the press, we've had to work with the Pakistanis. The Taliban will put out these statements saying that there were mass casualties, and uh, in many cases, it's just simply not true. And the Pakistani government, for some reason, thought it was in their interest to kind of uh, propagate these stories. They're now doing less of that. So, but just as a matter of morality, you should know that we really do try and hold ourselves to a pretty, pretty high standard. So by limiting that amount of thing, uh, that is one way to keep the, the reaction that you've talked about from happening. Also in Afghanistan, if to the extent that they can take public opinion polls there, we're still pretty popular in Afghanistan because uh, these people had to live under the Taliban. They don't really want them coming back. And so as we can kind of get into some of these places and empower them to build schools, to, to re-irrigate the fields, to have health clinics and all that kind of thing, that also is... Um, uh, helps to prevent the kind of reaction you're talking about. But it's, it's difficult because anytime you take military action and there's a, uh, a sometimes, sometimes mistakes are made. Sometimes that happens. And that is awful. Um, and it does lead to the kind of reaction you're talking about. The only way to deal with that is to hold yourself to a very high standard, number one, before you do that kind of thing, and number two, work with the people in a variety of other contexts to let them know that you're not there as a conqueror and that kind of thing. Iraq's a little bit different. Um, we can talk about that if you're interested, but uh, uh, in many ways that is not a natural nation state. 
And my guess is that as we withdraw from Iraq, which we are doing now, we'll become more popular there because they'll realize that, uh, I mean, Saddam killed three to 400,000 people. Uh, the, the Iraqis were being terrorized and killed uh, by their own government. And as we begin to withdraw, when in fact are withdrawing, they're gonna realize that uh, some of the sectarian uh, differences there and the violence, the terrorism that springs from that is probably gonna make us look better by comparison. But it is, um, it's a hard thing in that part of the world. You've probably seen in the newspaper, there was this uh, CIA contractor who's been arrested in Pakistan. He's being followed by some guys who apparently pulled guns on him, so he shot them first. And now the large sections of the Pakistani public think that there are you know, thousands of CIA agents running across Pakistan trying to influence their government and doing, there are a lot of conspiracy theories. Well, we, you know, we have some, remember the black helicopter, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theories in our own country? So that's part of human nature, but it seems to be particularly intense in that part of the world. And um, it's hard to deal with and it's just a fact of life. So I, I'm, the best answer I can give you to your question is, don't use physical force unless you absolutely have to. If you have to, hold yourself to a very high standard to minimize those kinds of things. When mistakes are made, offer immediate restitution. And even when mistakes aren't made, try and do things to help them build for themselves a vision of their country that they want, rather than a vision of their country as we would want. That's kind of how you go about it, but it's, it's very hard. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Good, where are you from? <laughs> Oh, excuse me. That's right. From South Bay, Indiana. Oh, good. A, yeah. ho a homie, huh? A homie, good. yeah. A, a townie. Uh huh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> um, I heard you go through a number of different th uh, discourses, just speaking about the different times that uh, America has to change or switch, switch gears and get in this industry or identifying itself in the world economy. And I was just listening to how we have and continue to do that but we never really address sort of the divide that you were just speaking about and how we continue to like, this, a sector of society grows economically and, and educational wise as well, why there is one society or a piece of society that's lagging behind. And also today I had an opportunity to go down to Indianapolis and uh, to the state capitol and I had a little fun hanging out with uh, the labor unions and oh, yeah. seeing how that whole political process worked because that was like democracy at its finest. But it's still. Was really there a big big rally there today? Oh, big rally! It was a huge rally. Have our guys come back from Urbana yet, or no? Oh, uh, I didn't see them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a little story, uh, and then we'll get to your question. I'll tell you a little story. The uh, so here I am, governor, and the phone rings at uh, 7 a.m. and I'm in the shower. I get out of the shower. I'm dripping wet. It's the speaker of the house on the phone, and uh, happened to be a Democrat at the time, and the Republicans were threatening to do this, and to to you know, not show up to break a quorum, so they couldn't do something or other. He was all hot and bothered. He said, uh, well, Governor, you know, the, uh, the um, Constitution gives you the authority to uh, compel them to attend, and you can have the state police arrest them and force them to come to the state house." And I said to him, well, Speaker, uh, you know, okay, let's assume for the sake of argument, I'm willing to entertain such a notion. There are like 48 of them. Where am I gonna find all these guys? And he said, well, I don't know about all of them, but the minority leader and his top deputy are running the mini marathon today. You can pick them up at the finish line. They'll be too tired to resist. <laughs> and I, I thought about that for a second. I said, I'm not too sure that's gonna look real good on the evening news. So <laughs> we ended up finding a different way to resolve the problem. So well, that's good, good of you for attending. You know, it's more people ought to get involved and uh, make, your, make your opinion known. That's good. Sure, and what I was getting at is that those, <laughs> People are enjoying themselves today. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, what happens is that, and what I've been seeing um, since my start in public service has happened, that we really never address the fact that there is that divide there, and we're looking now at particularly the middle class maybe being destroyed or being taken out because of some of the union busting and th different things that are going on. But there is also the spinoff when you're dealing with the union busting because you have families so to speak, or people who you know uh, live and get paid high wages or good wages, what happens is that they are no longer to take care of their families the way they were before, which falls on the children and their education opportunities. And so you know you have this big you know pile of mess actually at the end of the day. And so my question is, is that as we are moving in here in South Bend into uh, this innovative society where we're going to be moving to nanotech and the whole nine, which I think is fabulous. How do we go to those who are possibly on survival mode 
and get them to start agreeing or working towards this, this outcome that we're all succeeding for or, or working towards. I think that there is like, uh, it's a fine line, you know, because you're dealing with charity versus opportunity when you are dealing with people who necessarily don't believe in education or think that there is an outlet through education, but then you have this segment of society saying, well, great, you know, education is the be most beautiful thing on God's green earth, and we are going to grow. So you have this divide there, and like I said, the middle part right now is being attacked through, you know, special interests or whatnot. So my, that's my question. My question is definitely, how do we develop these conversations and moving forward to start bringing along that lag that we're feeling? Well, that's a great question. and. Uh you know, you have articulated very well the so-called middle-class squeeze, you know, where the cost of uh, college is going up, the cost of health care is going up, the uh, uh, cost of housing was going up for a while. You know, now prices are falling somewhat. But the cost of basically all the things we associate with the middle-class standard of living were going up while incomes were stagnant. So the real question is, what do we need to do to create, you know, good-paying jobs, and what do we do to kind of to control the cost of the factors that go into a middle class standard of living. And I've always thought that opportunity and personal response, how do we start the conversation? You know, if you just go out to the public and say, particularly at a hard pressed time like this, you just say, well, we need more, more resources for this or this. You know, even if it's right, it's kind of a hard sell because people say, you know, I'm kind of struggling to make ends meet. Why do I want to pony up more money for you know, somebody else or, or this thing? And so you, you've got to make the case of a couple of things. Number one, it's in their enlightened self-interest. I mean, we're all in it together. And, uh, you know, if my well-being and your well-being doesn't end at the end of our driveway, you know, people are suffering across town, sooner or later it's going to end up in my front yard. And so even if you take a fairly narrow view of your own self-interest, you know, sooner or later it's got to encompass uh, the community at large. It's hard to prosper if the community and the society of which you're a member are not doing well. And that case you know, can be made. And here, you know, here's an example. In our state, during my time as governor, we enacted something called the 21st Century Scholars. And I always thought that was a great thing. Because it said on the one hand to uh, any you know, child growing up, seventh grade, uh, who was you know, qualified for the free lunch program, so by definition, you're coming from a more modest household, it said, look, we're going we're gonna to give you an opportunity to go to college. Uh, but that's not all there is to it. You got to do your part too. You got to stay in school. You got to get a certain grade point average, and you can't get uh, involved with drugs or alcohol. That's your commitment. And if you do that, we'll give you the equivalent of a scholarship to a public university of your choice, or you can go to a private school, Notre Dame, DePaul. Many do. Uh, I know a fair number go to I IUSB. And so the reason behind that was a an acknowledgement that you know if that. 30% are just left behind economically as some kind of underclass. We're going to underperform economically. It's going to lead to social unrest. And so opportunity uh, for them was not only good for them, it's good for all of us. But it was so the, the sale I was able to make to the legislature and to the people of our state, even in a more conservative state, was to say, we're not just giving. This is not a, this is not a, a giveaway. This is not a freebie. they got to do their part, too. And uh, we reformed some of the welfare laws in the state to make them more work-oriented. So to say, look, if you're down on your luck and you need a helping hand, well, that happens in life. But you're going to have to stay in an educational course or a vocational course. You're going to have to do certain things, you know, apply for jobs and things like that so that you're making yourself more employable. You're going to take a job when it comes along. So it's kind of a, uh, it's, we're all in it together sort of thing. And so I think that's the construct we need to uh, employ. Define people's well-being broadly, which I think is true, and then show that the folks that we're trying to help that they have to be uh, to demonstrate personal responsibility, that they're doing their part too with the opportunity that we're giving them. It's not just a hand out, it's a hand, it's a hand up. I think that's the, the right way to, um, to go about it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yes, who's over here? Nope. Oh, Father John. <laughs> you, you, could, you, could, you can always ask a question, Father. It's, it's, I'll tell you what, if you can ask short questions, I'll try and give short answers. It reminds me, uh, when I had, uh, I can't remember where I was, but I would about run out of time, and I said, I got time for one more question, if you can make it a yes or no question. And the person looked at me and said, uh, what do you think about health care? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's not really a yes or no question, but if I had to say uh, yes, I'd, I'd say yes, we need health care. Uh, yeah, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from the uh, district of... Um 
I'm from Illinois' third district. I'm proudly represented by a moderate Democrat. Uh -huh. But um, I remember hearing, or rather watching on the internet, Rand Paul's maiden speech to the Senate, or what I seem to recall is his maiden speech. Anyway, he talked about- You having trouble his, sleeping? <laughs> a little bit. I'm, that's, that's a joke. That's a, people sleep so during that. my speeches, too. Um, well, he was talking about his predecessor in that seat, Henry Clay, how he was known as a great compromiser, but he pointed out that he ended up compromising with slavery, which was an undeniably great evil. So my question is, at what, ex to, at what point can we refuse to compromise? At what point can we not afford morally to compromise with an opposing ideology? Well, that's an excellent question, and there's no uh, clear uh, answer to that. It's a little bit like beauty or art. It's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, clearly you need to have morals and principles that you don't compromise. I mean, some things, slavery would be a perfect example. You can't compromise on something like that. So there have to be what I would call principled compromises. If it's something that doesn't go to your core, that deals with something that is a moral imperative, then there's room for uh, a consensus building. That's going to you know, differ person by person. But uh, the, longer, the, the larger the zone that is um, just off limits to at least having a conversation about, the less likely you are to get anything done. So if you think that things are going great and you don't care if you know, we just kind of keep going the way we're going, it's more, that's more likely to uh, lead to that sort of uh, outcome. But uh, the, the last thing you want to be is just a, a soulless compromiser for whom you got no principles, no values, everything's up for discussion, that just doesn't matter. You can't be that, but at the same time, you can't be, uh, you know, it's all my way. It has to be 100% what I think, and everything is a moral issue. Everything is a matter of principle. Nothing is up for discussion. That just leads, that's just a dead end. That just leads to gridlock. So somewhere between those two polars is kind of the right balance, and it's going to be, it's going to be different for every person. My guess is that for Rand, I hope he has a great distinguished career. My guess is that he'll probably be uh, the, the zone for him that would be not susceptible discussion will be a little bit larger and for some other people uh, than for some other people. It's just, a, it's just a personal matter that each of us in our conscience has to um, decide for ourselves. So there's, there's really no you know, clear definitive answer for something like that, but slavery would be an obvious example where that should be a moral imperative. And in fact, we fought a, a very bloody civil war to eradicate that institution, as we, as we should have. Thank you. By the way, one other vignette, and I get to a question over here. So I'm, I'm minding my own business in the State House uh, one day when I was governor, and the Pacers are playing the New York Knicks in the finals of the uh, Eastern you know, NBA championship, and the game is in Indianapolis. And so Spike Lee, the film director, who's a big fan of the Knicks, flew into town for the game, and the press all met him out at the airport. And we were having the NBA Eastern Conference Finals, the Indianapolis 500, and a presidential visit, Bill Clinton was coming to town, all at the same time. So the hotels were just all packed. And so some, some of these reporters asked, the, uh, asked Spike, he said, well, Spike, where are you going to be staying? There aren't any hotel rooms. And his response was, well, I'm going to stay at the slave quarters up at the governor's house. <laughs> well, the uh, press car all beat, a door, uh, all beat a path to my door at the governor's office to ask me about this. And the reason I bring all this up is I said, well, Spike's a great great director, but he needs to brush up on his history some. As I recall, Indiana fought on the side of the North to end that particular institution, <laughs> and if he wants to, I can give him a tour of a cemetery here in town where several thousand people gave up their lives to do just that. So um, he never took me up on the offer. <laughs> yes, miss? Is there time for this question? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll make it brief. Where are you from? All right. I'm from Chicago, but I've oh, had the privilege great. of working with many um, people from Indiana. Well, you know, we call Chicago Greater Indiana, so you Oh, know. all right. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I mean, your, your population is some of the most friendly and hardworking people that I've had the privilege to meet, so oh, the, Indiana you. is great. Um, I have, um, I'm particularly fascinated, but also deeply disquieted by your decision to move on from serving in the Senate, because even though you've displayed a lot of optimism about America's government and its people, it also seems like that's definitely a strong stance against the current system. You mentioned that you had some ideas or you had seen some potential for reform 
And one of the things that you have already mentioned was simply um, civilian activism to not support partisanship. Do you, excuse me. Do you have any other suggestions for, um, for how you see um, bridging this gap to come about? And do you think that can happen anytime soon? Because um, it seems like that and debt are two of the greatest obstacles to our progress. So, that is you. a great question. And you know, all these things are individual decisions, but uh, you don't have to serve uh, in the United States Senate, thank goodness, or be governor of the state, or to sit on a stage like this to make a difference. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons for my decision was that, you know, months would go by and not much would happen, and uh, it was more fighting and fussing than it was actually doing things about the things I cared about. So, you know, if you tutor uh, a child, that makes an incredible uh, difference in that individual. It's something tangible, something real. It's not political rhetoric. If you uh, go to a nursing home and help a senior citizen, that makes uh, a, a real difference. If you work at a food pantry, that makes a real difference. I mean, there are a whole host of, wa whole host of ways that you can contribute to making this a better, more just country than just running for political office. Now, if you run for political office, you can make a contribution there too. And I'm uh, proud of the things that we were able to accomplish. And Here's another example. I would never, I wouldn't have been elected dog catcher or been able to do anything in the public arena if it hadn't been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people, helping me out. So if you see someone you believe in who shares your ideals, who you think has some good practical ideas uh, that can actually get done, help them out. That's another way you can make a contribution. So there are just a whole host of ways. And I'm, um, uh, my, my faith and optimism is restored uh, when I get out of Washington. And I got some ideas about what we can do to make Washington better too. But when I get out of Washington, in communities like South Bend or Indianapolis or my hometown of Terre Haute or wherever I happen to be, and I see what people are doing at the local level, in universities and businesses and local charities, that's where you can see real things happening that, that, whoop, excuse me, that make you feel good, that really make you see, see progress being made on an individual level. So, Wherever your passions run, wherever your interests lie, uh, think, about, think about how you can participate in, in that way. And that's a, good, that's a good start. And if you want to run for office someday, let me know. I can give you some advice about that, too. <laughs> but it's, it's, not the only, it's not the only way. Thank you. I got time for one more before the father has got to use the hook on me here. Yes. Uh, it's me again. One quick question. Yeah, didn't you switch sides? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Reminds me, there was one, uh, this doesn't apply to you, but there was a fella, there was a fella from Texas, his name was John Conley, he'd been a governor down there, and he was a very close friend of LBJ, and he was a big Democrat, he was riding in the car with John Kennedy when President Kennedy was shot, but his political philosophy kind of changed over time, and he ended up uh, joining the Republican Party and ran for president, uh, the nomination, one year for president, well, unsuccessfully. In any event, there was a very tart-tongued assistant for Johnson who was uh, informed that uh, Connolly had switched parties from uh, Democrat to Republican. And uh, her response was, first known case of a rat swimming toward a sinking ship. <laughs> she apparently didn't hold him in very high regard. So wow. and anyway, it's OK that you switch sides here. We won't, uh, won't uh, okay. hold that against you. So she there... also said when he switched parties, it... <laughs> she was great. She said when he switched parties, it increased the average IQ of both. <laughs> wow. Go ahead. Um, so is there, is there anything that you know about politics now, about the way things work, that you didn't know and you wished you had known when you were an undergraduate? Uh, oh, lots of things. But any, anything in particular? You mean practical? You mean how to run a campaign or what it's like to serve an office? Or? Oh. What, what do you think is the thing that you that it would be most useful for us to know, I suppose, you know? Uh, about running for office or about serving an office, which... Uh, about the way politics works. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of misconceptions about what goes on behind closed doors. Well, uh, yeah, you know, there's good and, good and not, not so much. Um, the good news is, you know, 99.99% of the people I've been privileged to serve with and know in public life are good, decent, honest, hardworking people really motivated by trying to do what they think is the right thing. 
And uh, it's the rare exceptions that get all the publicity. And uh, so this unfortunate image of you know, public figures being uh, greedy, self-interested, you know, so forth, that's just not been my experience. Now, they, they may have substantially different views about what they think the right thing to do is. But I mean, for example, Bob Dole, who's a great guy, a wonderful uh, Republican leader, he was once asked, he served in the Congress for 30 some years in the House and in the Senate was the Republican leader for a while. He was once asked if Congress was more honest today or how the ethics were compared to when he got started. His response was, are you kidding me? It's not even close. You know, when he got started, people actually carried bags of cash around and things like that. Now, you know, it just, that sort of thing just doesn't happen. I mean, it just, you know, doesn't happen. Uh, or when it does, rarely, the people go to jail as they should. So. The level of ethics is just much improved. And, um, but we have a system, and this relates to the topic that we're discussing about here. Our system of governance, as I suggested in the beginning of my comments, was built uh, a system of checks and balances uh, within the federal government, and then a federal system with federal, state, and local governments designed to serve as a check upon the powers of government against our individual liberties. Uh, in a dynamic world characterized by rapid rates of change, our inability to adjust our approach to take into account that rapid change because of the system that we have is something that we have to take a look at. You know, how do we go about preserving the checks and balances on government, but at the same time enable us to make the necessary changes and not have a government characterized by dysfunction? Uh, that's something that uh, we need to think very, um, uh, very clearly about. So I'd say the good news is most people are uh, very well motivated. The level of ethics is really pretty high. Uh, the unknown, see, I, there, there's not a person who worked with me in the governor's office and not a person who worked with me in the United States Senate who couldn't have made a lot more money doing something else. That's just the way it is. I mean, a lot more money. People leave those jobs and go out and you know, double or triple their salaries the next day. And so it's a sacrifice on their part, it's a sacrifice on their family's part, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but um, this tendency to uh, demonize our opponents and that sort of thing, and with the whole blogosphere out there now and the internet, which is a wonderful thing, but a lot of the stuff that just swirls around is pretty virulent. And so without being naive or uh, you know, kind of a Pollyanna of some kind, I would hope we'd focus on the fact Here's one of my favorite sayings. I would hope we'd focus on the fact that we're Americans first, not Democrats or Republicans first, and we really all are in this together. One of my favorite sayings was from a civil rights leader who said, uh, we may have arrived on these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. That's exactly right. And we gotta start thinking that way. Because as I mentioned, the Chinese are moving ahead, uh, the Indians are attempting to move ahead, the developing or you know, it's a competitive world uh, now. And unless we start thinking collectively about, okay, we may have our differences, but we gotta find that common ground uh, that we can build on. Uh, even as I suggested to the last question I got from that, Mike, we try and uh, be true to our, our principles and values. If, if we're just kinda arguing amongst ourselves, the rest of the world's gonna move on down the road. And at that point, the American future might be in jeopardy. But I hope it won't come to that. And I think America is at its best. Uh, in moments of crises when the chips are really down. Problem is, if you wait until that moment, it tends to be more difficult to solve. And that certainly is the case with our fiscal challenges. So uh, really good people in a system that is uh, uh, somewhat dysfunctional right now. And to get back to this young Lee's uh, last question, one of the things I learned about myself, I became governor, I was elected Secretary of State when I was 30, became governor when I was 33. And I really realized that I'm more of an executive at heart. I love running things. I love making things happen. I love implementing decisions. I love the Senate too. If you're intellectually curious, it's fascinating the different things you get into. I never knew a whole lot about uh, global security issues and that kind of thing. Now, I was on both the Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee. I know a whole lot about that stuff. And it's deeply important. I was the chairman of the International Trade and Finance Subcommittee, the Bank Committee, so overseeing the International Monetary Fund and global economics, fascinating stuff. But uh, months go by, we didn't do anything. And so I think life is, I guess I'm more of a doer. I, like, I get my satisfaction, like I was suggesting to her, you know, I'd rather you know, help one person than to just think about helping thousands of people even if it never actually happens. So that's, just kind of, that's more the way I'm wired. And you got a, you got a, a, a little 
a little introspection is a good thing, as long as you don't get uh, uh, paralyzed by self-doubt. Right. that answer your question a little bit? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Yeah, good luck to you. I, I don't have to ask you where you're from, <laughs> unless you've moved here in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> well, is it time to, time to wrap this up? Well, let me say this. Um, I hope all of you, each in your own way, will figure out a way to um, give something back to our society, uh, to this university. Uh, because it has been now, after 55 years of life, uh, it has been my strong experience that what really makes life worthwhile is not what you uh, take out of it, but what you give back. You know, it's what you do for others, uh, not what others do for you, which if, uh, Father, this is the last thing I'll say. I was, uh, I got my degree in business economics at uh, uh, another institution a little south of here in Bloomington. And then I went to the University of Virginia to a law school, which my mother, my mother grew up on a farm in a little wheat town uh, called Enid, Oklahoma, back starting in the Great Depression and uh, on forward. And uh, she always wanted to go to the University of Virginia because she loved to read history and she loved Thomas Jefferson. But until the early 1970s, the University of Virginia did not admit women. So she never had a chance to go to uh, UVA, but was very, very proud that her son uh, ended up going to school there. And I was a first year law student when my mother passed away, but not until she had a chance to come down and see the university and all that kind of thing. The reason I mention all that is that, uh, uh, of course, Thomas Jefferson was from Charlottesville, where the university is located, and his home, Monticello, was on a hill outside of town from which he could look out at uh, the university that he had founded and actually had laid out the center grounds for and actually did uh, some of the uh, architectural drawings for. And he's, uh, if you go to visit Monticello and you go back behind the house, there's a garden there and you keep going, you come to the family burial plot for uh, their family and that's where Thomas Jefferson was laid to rest. And there, there is his headstone. It's not terribly elaborate and uh, he wrote his own epitaph. And uh, as uh, legend would have it, whether this is apocryphal or not, I don't know, but the story is told that Jefferson, uh, what is true is Jefferson did write it, but the story is told that he showed it to a friend of his uh, at some point before he passed away uh, to ask for his friend's uh, response. And here's what's etched on Thomas Jefferson's headstone. It says, uh, here lies Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, author of the Law for Religious Freedom for the People of Virginia, founder of the University of Virginia. That's what it says. And this conversation he allegedly had with his friend went something like this. Showed him and he asked for his friend's response. And after thinking for a moment, his friend replied, he said, well, Mr. Jefferson, surely that is not enough. You do not mention that not once but twice you were elected to the highest office that can be bestowed upon a citizen of our nation, the presidency of the United States. Surely you have to mention that. You don't mention that you were elected to the second highest office in the land, the Vice Presidency of the United States. You must mention that. You don't mention that you were Secretary of State uh, or any of the other high honors, Ambassador to France at a critical moment. Surely you must mention those. Uh, to which Jefferson allegedly replied, he said, uh, no, my friend, I would much prefer to be remembered for what I have been privileged to do for others, not for what others have so kindly done for me. If each of us can live our lives that way, not only will our lives be richer, but our country will be the better for it as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Thanks, Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Can I just give a quick shout out to the former governor and lieutenant governor of the state, uh, Joe Kernan and his wonderful wife, Maggie, who I see uh, sitting yeah. over here. Yeah.
graduate of Notre Dame. Ah. Yeah. But uh, I, I came up, Senator Vi, not in any way to cut you off, but I know you're dealing with 12-hour uh, jet lag. You've been on a plane for two days, very little sleep. You went through the trauma of an earthquake. And I, I just want to say how impressed and how grateful we are that you would come and share your thoughts on so many issues, including that, that traumatic experience with us. It, it just says a lot for you about uh, what, what you do for others. And we're just deeply grateful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I've got, uh, yes. Just an expression of our gratitude and a memento of uh, your visit, uh, a picture of the Golden Dome here at Notre Dame. Well, thank, thank you. you. And, and uh, your, your athletic director, who's been a longtime friend of mine, uh, Jack Swarbrick, was kind enough to send me a note uh, uh, suggesting that uh, perhaps I, along with my sons attend the uh, Notre Dame Maryland game at FedEx Field in Washington so you can count on our family uh, they're rooting for the Irish there next uh, next fall <laughs> <laughs>